Okay, so welcome to the uh, the fourth of our fourth session of our four part course on uh, the life and legacy of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you've listened to Ed Steers talk about Lincoln's early life, and I talk about Lincoln as a politician, as commander in chief. And now we're going to wrap it all up with uh, John O'Brien, who's going to talk about uh, Lincoln's legacy. So as with the previous ones, we're recording this. So everyone should remain on mute until the very end. Uh, you can throw a question in the chat at any time, but we won't discuss it till the very end. And, and that's, that's where we'll go. At the end, we'll do take a full Q&A as long as we need. So with that, I will turn it over to John O'Brien to talk about Lincoln's uh, legacy. Go ahead, John. You need to unmute. Now? All right, my uh, interest in the Lincoln legacy probably began uh, when my dad took me to the 100th anniversary of the Gettysburg battle. I learned about uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address there, and I've been hooked ever since. I moved to uh, D.C. in 2005 and there enjoyed uh, my interest in researching Lincoln at the Archives and Library of Congress. And then I joined Lincoln's Church, and I'm still the Lincoln historian at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church uh, in Washington. So I continue to maintain that interest in developing thoughts on what made Lincoln so memorable in American history. The Lincoln Memorial is the grandest monument erected to any American. Lincoln's statue is seated beneath the inscription, in this temple as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the nation, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. Polls of scholars and the general public consistently rank Lincoln as the best American president. We credit him with a legacy enjoyed by his countrymen down to the present age. What defines Lincoln's legacy beyond simple likability or popularity? According to Webster's legacy is something of value transmitted by or received from an ancestor or predecessor. Synonyms include bequest, birthright, heritage, inheritance. The most lasting accomplishments attributed to Lincoln are preservation of the union, vindication of democracy, and the end of slavery. These were accomplished with his admirable manner in managing the crisis. His is a legacy of both substance and style in shaping national opinion in favor of the better angels of our nature. Lincoln said, I claim not to have controlled events, but can best plainly that events have controlled me. Some historians had cited this as an admission of passivity. In fact, it is more an assertion of modesty as he was well prepared to act when events presented the opportunity. He accepted and built on the circumstances for improvement that came during the war. Today, we will review how Lincoln created a plan for his life and his country. The result of his foresight was the development of a set of skills that enabled him to act effectively at critical moments and to do it in a manner that set an expectation for the behavior of future statesmen. It certainly would have been ended differently if someone else were in office. He was particularly good at mobilizing the nation by appealing to its highest ideals while acting with malice toward none in pursuit of a perfect, more perfect, more just, and more enduring union. Lincoln was a successful leader and an exemplary, if imperfect, public man. His legacy has been called into question in recent years by writers who have explored cultural conflict issues in the development of our society. I will review these accusations and their defense at the end today. Despite these protestations, there is good reason to appreciate Lincoln's continuing high standing in American public opinion. Lincoln was a prolific writer. He collected works were published 60 years ago in 11 volumes and more than 7,000 pages. Lincoln did not keep a diary, but was in the habit of making notes on scraps of paper that were the raw material for his speeches and letters. My argument today can best be made by analyzing five documents written over his adult life. 
They reveal the foundations of his political thought and trace the evolution of a superior mind as it formed a strategy and engaged in resolving the American crisis. Uh, today, uh, lucky me, uh, is the anniversary of the Lyceum Address, which he delivered in January 27, 1838. The House divided speech was in 1858. Meditation on the divine will was a private musing which preoccupied the Emancipation Proclamation along with the reply to Horace Greeley's editorial. And we're gonna finish with remarks on the end of the war that he made from the White House on April 11, 1865. You have learned in our previous classes something of the environment of early 19th century America on the Western frontier. Lincoln developed an early disdain for slavery despite it being everywhere around him and accepted by his peers. He chose a political career in the Whig Party whose platform demanded an active government involved with infrastructure, improvements like roads, canals, and bridges. He idolized fellow Whig Henry Clay for his ability to suppress his personal interest to create compromise for the public good. Clay was a Kentucky slave owner who negotiated the Missouri Compromise. This agreement limited the extension of slavery into the vast Louisiana Purchase Territory. Lincoln credited Clay with averting a potential civil war in 1821. When Clay died in 1850, Lincoln wondered if divine providence would ever again deliver such an instrument to prevent disaster. Clay's conservative positioning attracted broad support in North and South and made possible the most important conflict resolution since the Constitutional Convention. Lincoln aspired to be like Clay. Lincoln was not an abolitionist. He observed the social divisions that slavery issue was promoting. Early in his political career, he was alarmed at the increase of mob violence, beatings, and lynchings that prevented rational discussion of possible solutions and undermined respect for the law. This was a threat to public order and responsible civil society. No democratic government could survive, he reasoned, under the threat of citizens who choose to act on their violent emotions rather than on rational debate and the ballot box. This illustration pictures the mob violence that killed abolitionist Elijah Lovejoy in 1837. Lovejoy's murder was fresh in his mind when Lincoln gave one of his first policy speeches. He was not yet 29, a new lawyer and aspiring politician when Lincoln was invited to speak to the young men at the Lyceum School in Springfield. He gave a civics lesson that revealed the first inklings of the beliefs and tactics that would soon bring him broad public recognition in Illinois. In this remarkably prescient speech, Lincoln shared those principles that he would hold and build on over the rest of his life. Lincoln began with uh, by expressing his fundamental respect for the law, the law, the institutions, and the political traditions that supported them. Here we get an early peek into what would become his lifelong dedication to preserving unity. He is aware that passion and political discussions will contort issues in ways that emphasize divisions. He has identified slavery as the issue of his time and he will calmly seek to devise a path for its ultimate extinction. The fundamental question raised by Garrison and the abolitionist was whether the constitution was a pro-slavery document. Determined to work within the law, Lincoln insisted that the Constitution was in fact an anti-slavery document that only made a few concessions to recognize slavery as a local institution. Freedom was the national rule and slavery the exception. Lincoln will walk a fine line to devise a consistent legal argument limiting slavery, not wanting to confront the casual and ubiquitous racism of his countrymen. He consciously enlisted the prevailing culture of biblical Christianity. He set about creating the Lincoln brand, defined by love of country and its traditions, respect for law, and advocating fairness for all. He, for all. he cultivates relationships as an affable storyteller, but as a hard worker who conducts serious business effectively. He built his case on respect for the Bible and the predominant Christian ethos of the country. Adherence to religion which was so common in that day, must extend to respect for secular law. He opposed slavery as bad policy. He took pains to craft the most logical arguments 
for reform consistent with conservative popular sentiment. In Lyceum, Lincoln preaches good civic behaviors and begins to shape his professional life as a model public man. Oops, I wanted to uh, emphasize that last point there, the, the, the quote attributed to him in that speech, which carried on through his development of strategies throughout his career, was reason, cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason. And that became the hallmark of his strategies and development and speeches uh, throughout his political career. Lincoln was building a successful law practice when the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 outraged him and brought him back into politics. This legislation was written by Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas as a gambit to appease both anti- and pro-slavery factions with the argument that people in the territories should be able to vote whether or not they wanted slavery. What could be more democratic than popular sovereignty? Let the people decide. Lincoln recognized this was a flagrant violation of the old compromise agreements that specified the new territories would remain free soil. The former one-term congressman invigorated the new Republican Party in Illinois and became its candidate to defeat the incumbent Democrat, Senator Douglas. The theme of his acceptance speech was thought too provocative, suggesting war, he was advised. In it, Lincoln aroused the concerns raised in the Bible. A house divided itself cannot stand, probably a reference to the Gospel of Matthew in which Christ refutes accusations he is Satan because he cast out devils. Satan could not be successful working against his own interest. Lincoln here exposes the problem of allowing votes that would expand slavery as putting the country at a greater risk of continued division. He also subtly aligns himself with Christ as one casting out devils. In his speech, Lincoln clarifies the policy. The union would become all one thing or all the other. There is no basis for compromise because he said of the Dred Scott decision. The extension of slavery into the territories was also about extension into the Northern states. That was the point of Dred Scott. Americans did not have the right, the court said, to, have, to limit slavery anywhere. He urged that the, his friends in the Republican Party had to help obey the fugitive slave law. Of course, this earned him criticism from the abolitionists. But nonetheless, he had to act consistent with the law, and that was the law. But he insisted on something further, that those who wanted the fugitive slave law honored also had to recognize that the fugitive slaves themselves had legal rights which needed to be honored. Equality was essential to the ongoing work of creating a more perfect union with more freedom for all. And finally, he laid out the elements of his plan for eliminating slavery, which he remained consistently bound to up until the middle of his presidency. Uh, Lincoln planned to abolish slavery through compensation, that is buying the slaves and, and freeing them, voluntary colonization, voter approval, this all required the consent of the white voters, and it had to be gradual over decades to make sure that it was a peaceful transition for both races. Two of the most widely known slavery debate figures in the antebellum era were self-emancipated abolitionist orator Frederick Douglass and the race-baiting, slave-owning presidential aspirant Stephen Douglass. Frederick was committed to securing the death of slavery everywhere and full and equal rights for black men. The vast majority of Americans did not agree with him. Douglass first became aware of Lincoln when he read about the House Divided Speech. Douglas was impressed and told friends that he would be following Lincoln's campaign. Stephen Douglas claimed to be indifferent to the morality of slavery. This solution as to what his solution as to whether new states would be admitted as slave or free would be determined by white people who expressed their sovereign opinion at the ballot box. He cited the authority of the Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision as controlling that black people had no rights that white people were required to honor and they certainly could not become citizens. He defined himself as the white man's candidate. The two Douglases defined the ends of the spectrum of antebellum politics. Lincoln was seeking the way to bring enough white voters to a position away from Stephen 
and closer to Frederick. In 1858, Stephen would continue to prevail. Lincoln challenged the incumbent Senator Stephen Douglas to a series of debates in late 1858. Lincoln emerged as an advocate of full civil rights for blacks. He gave the most robust defense of the Constitution as an anti-slavery document that promised equality for all. Douglas was relentless, impressing Lincoln to state his embrace of full Negro equality with the white race. Lincoln explained that he opposed the Dred Scott decision because it deprives the Negro of the rights and privileges of citizenship. Douglas pounced, I ask you, are you in favor of conferring upon the Negro the rights and privileges of citizenship? If so, you desire Negro citizenship. If you desire to allow him to come into the state and settle with the white men, if you desire him to vote on equality with yourselves and to make them eligible for office, to serve on juries, and to adjudge your rights, then support Mr. Lincoln and the Black Republican Party who are in favor of citizenship for the Negro. I hold that a Negro is not and never ought to be a citizen of the United States. I do not believe that the Almighty made the Negro capable of self-government. Lincoln was crushed by the master race beta of his era. He was forced to back down protecting the more limited rights the blacks deserved to eat the bread they produced by the sweat of their own brow and otherwise to be left alone. Lincoln's racism was so Illinois racism was so pronounced, Lincoln still lost the election. But in the process, Lincoln revealed his true heart and commitment to equality that would reemerge later. Now he was positioned to win the bigger prize when he was elected president in 1860. Lincoln was inaugurated on March 4, 1861. He was unable to thread the compromise needle in his model statesman Henry Clay had done in 1820. Seven slave states had already seceded before Lincoln took the oath. His promise to not touch slavery where it existed comported with how most people interpreted the Constitution and attracted broad support in the North. But the South viewed as repugnant any restriction on their right to take slave property anywhere. No compromise was possible. Further limiting Lincoln's options was the fact that the man administering his oath was the author of the Dred Scott decision and who would judge the legality of Lincoln's policies, Chief Justice Roger Taney. Here is where Lincoln begins to demonstrate a growing interest in the role God would be playing in the war. In his inauguration address, Lincoln proposed that God had a choice to make in determining the destiny of the nation. If war was to come, Lincoln declared, God would decide whether the Union permanently divided or was preserved as it was that day with slavery continuing. These were the positions of the contending sides. Lincoln was certain that God would defend the Constitution and the American Union. The first year of the war was fought on the sole basis of restoring the Union as it was with slavery intact. Congress passed that resolution with full support of even the most radical members. In early 1862, as the war started to drag on, Lincoln began to test emancipation strategies. Early in 1862 was when differing religious groups stepped up their campaigns to have Lincoln comply with God's will. For some, that was simply declaring an end to slavery. For others, God's will was that he stay the course to restore the union with slavery intact. Then in February, his cherished 11-year-old son, Willie, died. The growing pressures of the war now combined with his personal grief to challenge him to better understand the will of God. From February through summer, Lincoln met frequently with his pastor, the Reverend Phineas Gurley, for counseling. The will of God prevails was the private musing that many described as a, a prayer, a hope, a wish. Some say it's the draft of the second inaugural. But in it, he notes that uh, there are significant differences in what he believes now than what he believed before he came present. The will of God implies that God has a will and has a plan for people. This is traditional Christian views that he began to adopt away from his earlier fatalism of his younger years. He notes that the, in great contest, people claim that God is on their side. 
He observes that one may be, both may be, and one must be wrong. God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. His conclusion is that in the present civil war, it is quite possible that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either party. And what were the two purposes that were defined here? Secession with slavery or union with slavery? Uh, this is the beginning of the logical and theological decisions that Lincoln would make leading up to the Emancipation Proclamation. Horace Greeley used his national newspaper to goad the administration to do more to liberate slaves. In August 1862, he wrote that millions of Northerners were frustrated that Lincoln was not more aggressive in seizing the slave property of rebel sympathizers. Lincoln responded by having a different paper print his response that has become the most widely misunderstood letter of this presidency. My policy is I would save the union. And then he lays out the options. Some scholars argue that Lincoln here declares himself to be fine with slavery if it is required to save the union. Lincoln already had the draft of the Emancipation Proclamation in his desk waiting for the right moment. This Greeley letter works well with his assessment of the will of God as being so hard to fathom that he would come to his own conclusion that God and the American public would tend toward justice. That justice would be denied if the union were to permanently divide. Saving the union and ending slavery were a single linked objective. One could not be achieved without the other. And the options that Lincoln spelled out for Greeley for a national audience and was published in newspapers across the country. If I could save the union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. Lincoln is here signaling to the nation that he's in fact considering some move against slavery. In the end, he chose the latter option of freeing some and not freeing others as the military necessity required. Lincoln informed his cabinet on September 22nd that he would proclaim emancipation on January 1, 1863. This was done under the authority as commander in chief for military reasons. He had already warned field commanders that such emancipation can be enforced only as long as the military need existed. Their effect in law thereafter would be null and void. He knew that while this event was historically unprecedented, this was not the permanent solution to ending slavery. It would certainly make it more difficult to undo this blow to a slave society, but specific law was needed. It helped that Lincoln use the proclamation to also allow black men to make their own case for equal rights by joining the army and fighting for freedom on the same basis as white men. His reelection was in jeopardy in 1864. Lincoln's advisors were certain in August that he would not win re-election. This cartoon pictures his opponent, General George McClellan, in the middle as a referee between Lincoln saying, no peace without abolition, and Jefferson, Jefferson Davis saying, no peace without separation. Lincoln was being hung out on the emancipation issue and the fact that the war was still dragging on. In spite of his situation, Lincoln did not declare a military emergency to cancel the election. And he pushed the Senate to pass the 13th Amendment. He asked Frederick Douglass to accept a commission to travel south to encourage more slaves to self-emancipate by fleeing to Union lines. Lincoln prepared his cabinet to transfer power, but fortunes changed on September 5 when Sherman captured Atlanta. Lincoln won re-election in a landslide that carried more Republicans into Congress. Those new representatives would not take their seats until the following year. Lincoln decided not to wait for the assured supermajority. He wanted a 13th Amendment passed as quickly as possible in case the South was to surrender in time to vote down the amendment. The movie Lincoln captured his sense of urgency and his demand for the few votes necessary to carry the amendment early in 1865. Daniel Day-Lewis pounded the table and declared, 
I am president of the United States, clothed in immense power. You, Mr. Seward and Mr. Ashley, will procure those votes for me. They were successful. The main Confederate army surrendered on April 9, 1865. Lincoln promised to make remarks at the White House on April 11. Other government officials had already made stemwinder speeches on how the South would now get what it deserved, etc. Fairly traditional victory chest thumping remarks. Lincoln chose a different approach for this, the last speech of his life. Lincoln instead simply thanked the army and then moved on to describe his plan for reconstructing the Union. He uh, insisted that the defeated states must accept emancipation and immediate full freedom for their black residents. Uh, returning states must accept the 10% uh, population rule. This is uh, the, the plan by which he wanted to reconstruct Louisiana in 1862 and 63, uh, where if you can find 10% of the population that would be willing to sign on to a new constitution and agree to end slavery, that uh, you, you would use that 10% to constitute the new government and they would arrange for the representation in Congress. Uh, finally, he said that the it's time to give blacks the vote and we need to educate their children as a national policy. One of the members of the audience was John Wilkes Booth and he was known to exclaim, that's the last speech he'll ever make. Through his life, Lincoln was a substantive and growing man in understanding and expanding constitutional rights. In the end, that included integrating African Americans into public life. Now, with the law clearly on the side of greater freedom for all, Lincoln was positioning the government to press forward. Today, we better appreciate and reconcile to the recognition of the history of those who have been undervalued in the narrative of American life. The work of many was required to achieve the ultimate result. Still, this cannot diminish the fact that Lincoln was the leader who was uniquely qualified and positioned to change the legal structure of freedom in the United States. We appreciate that he overcame the hardship of an early life and prevailing culture of racism. That he educated himself in politics, logic, and law to end slavery. He led with reason while controlling his emotions. He grew his understanding of the needs of others and of American potential. He set a strategy to attract support for mainstream Americans. He seized on ways to affect slavery, evolved a view of black citizenship. He proved the viability of American democracy lay in securing both union and freedom. This uh, artwork is uh, called Spaghetti Lincoln. It's by a Native American artist. The accusation against uh, Lincoln's uh, legacy is that he allowed the largest mass execution in American history. 303 Dakota Sioux were sentenced to death. Lincoln allowed 38 to be hanged. The, the Indian Bureau, of course, during uh, up until his administration and after was a, was a mess of corruption. Lincoln promised to deal with it after the war. He took time during December 1862, one of the most trying times of his presidency, to personally review all 303 cases and sustained only 38 as having sufficient evidence at trial to warrant execution. He did this in spite of the fact that there was absolutely no public support for what he did. The vast majority, almost exclusively of the voting public, had a lot of antipathy toward Native Americans, particularly after the savage attack that uh, prompted this, uh, this trial and hearing. The second accusation from African Americans uh, that he used racist language, preferred the white man prevail, as he actually said in the debate with Stephen Douglas. He wanted blacks deported, that is through colonization, always on a voluntary basis never acknowledged the suffering of the enslaved people 
and never freed a slave. Now, Lincoln had an extensive record of anti-slavery policies. He suppressed the Atlantic slave trade in a treaty with Britain. He prosecuted slave traders, having the only hanging of one on record. He declined to return escaped slaves pressed union generals to implement a free labor system and pressured and gave incentives to states to end slavery on their own. In the end, Lincoln made the decision to recruit black men into the army for both manpower and in anticipation of defending their equal rights. He died supporting their right to vote and full citizenship. The story in Richard Powerwood entitled his prize-winning Lincoln biography, A Life of Power and Purpose. This apt description was the outcome of Lincoln's extraordinary self-awareness in crafting his career to meet the needs of his still young country. He developed himself with specific skills and characteristics to be able to guide his fellow citizens at a moment when the risk to constitutional human rights was greatest. He was audaciously conservative, logically progressive and affably determined to extinguish slavery because it threatened liberty for all. With the precision of a rail splitter, Lincoln seized key opportunities to establish positions that he could rapidly exploit and expand using his insight to popular prejudices, his oratorical skills and his political savvy. The later reflections of some leading African-Americans capture the debt for all. Frederick Douglass was the first who realized that viewed from the genuine abolition ground, Mr. Lincoln seemed tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent. But measuring him by the sentiment of his country, the sentiment he was bound to consult, he was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. Measuring the tremendous magnitude of the work before him, infinite wisdom has seldom sent any man into the world better fitted for his mission. In W.E.B. Du Bois in 19, 8, 1922, the foibles and contradictions of the great do not diminish, but enhance the worth and meaning of their upward struggle. Of all the great figures of the 19th century, I love Lincoln not because he was perfect, because he was not, and yet triumphed. And then finally, Barack Obama, before he became president, I am fully aware of his limited views on race. In the midst of slavery's dark storm and the complexities of governing a house divided, he somehow kept his moral compass pointed firm and true. In summary, what are the main features of the Lincoln legacy that we continue to honor him as an example for all the land? First, Lincoln united the equality vision of the Declaration with the legal structure of the Constitution. Second, he set the standard for addressing the American people in candor and in hope. Third, he created the model for robust moral executive leadership constrained by respect for the Constitution. And finally, he invented a political style and party to shape public opinion to advance human rights as the fundamental basis for bettering our country. James Oakes wrote, Lincoln, was Lincoln a secular saint or a re reluctant emancipator? Both views assume he had enormous power that he simply did not have. He did not free all the slaves with a stroke of his pen because he could not. The idea that he could and did not may be a function of the times we live in. After a succession of imperial presidents, it's hard to remember that Lincoln lived in a world where the constitution limited at least as much as it empowered. The single most important achievement was the restoration of the Union by means of the revolutionary overflow of the largest and wealthiest slave society on earth. Philip Kunert said Lincoln will always remain the president who helped destroy slavery and preserve the Union with stubbornness, caution, and an exquisite sense of timing. Divided by some as an opportunist, he was in fact an artist responding to events as he himself changed over time, allowing himself to grow into a true reformer. Misjudged as a mere jokester, incompetent, unserious, he was in fact the most serious actor on the political stage. He was politically shrewd and he took a long view of history and he knew when to strike to obtain his ends. 
Lincoln was a patient man who refused to demonize others, a person of the middle who could build bridges across chasms. Just for his work on the 13th Amendment alone, he has earned a permanent place in the history of American and human freedom. Thank you. David, let's have some conversation. Great, thanks, John. That was uh, that was great. So we're gonna we're gonna go to questions. Um, I haven't seen any in the chat yet, but if you want to throw something in the chat, please do. Or if you want to just ask your question, uh, just chime in or raise your hand if a lot of people are talking, and I'll I will pick you up. And while people are thinking, I will ask you something, John. Um, in the Lyceum address, uh, do you know if that address was um, very widely published? He was very young at the time and didn't really have a following. Do you know if it was widely published? And It was picked up in the Springfield paper. Uh, not widely published, no. Do you know if it, if it had any effect? You know, this, this was in 1838, hey. right? So... Um, we went through into, we had the 1850s and bleeding Kansas. And, and my, my sense is there was a lot of mob rule going on in that mm -hmm. period of time. So um, do you think anybody really changed their behavior uh, because of that or, or, or not? Not because of it. I hope that he had some impact on the members of the class he was speaking to of the school, but it is remarkable to see those fundamental principles that he de defined at the age of 29, which he remained consistently adhered to throughout his uh, career. And uh, particularly his understanding that uh, slavery was a, the underlying issue of most of the conflict remaining in American society. And yet it had to be dealt with, not as an abolitionist, uh, ending at any cost, but with an eye on preserving law and order uh, as you move this uh, moral conclusion along. And the fact that he would identify in his own head at that time that he had to rely on reason, not emotion, cold, hard reason and logic to uh, fashion his arguments going forward as a way of avoiding the passions on either side to keep his head clear. Uh, Carol, you had put something in the chat. Do you want to uh, go ahead and ask that? Sure. Um, I may have misread what you were saying, but it sounded to me like you were bringing out that there's a theological dimension to this that matters. I'm glad and, you didn't miss that, Carol. Thank you. Well, I can't help it. I'm a theologian, so I'd love to hear <laughs> you say some more about why you think that and uh, whatever you'd like to say about it. Farwadine, Knoll, others have written that you, you cannot dismiss or underestimate the importance of religion in Lincoln's uh, evolving views during the war. I've got a paper coming out in which I'm trying to develop more of his uh, little known relationship with his pastor, Phineas Gurley, who was one of the uh, most renowned expositors of old school Presbyterian theology in the country, which is the reason his church. Uh, wanted to put him in D.C. Uh, he had an opportunity to begin to counsel Lincoln after Willie's death, even though Gurley had also been helpful to Lincoln in uh, developing a system by which pastors, chaplains could be engaged for the Union Hospital that were being built in D.C. Uh, Gurley also helped with the legislation to make that happen. Uh, so Lincoln was uh, aware of him and been happy with his sermons even before Willie. But once Willie died, they began to spend uh, hours together, early counseling uh, Lincoln in a way that his wife could not. Mary, of course, had her own problems. She withdrew from the world and from her family uh, and stayed in a room for essentially a month after Willie's death. Uh, so in seeking counsel, uh, Lincoln learned to trust his pastor, early. And I believe that during that time, as they discussed God's mysterious will, the role of providence in the world, that Lincoln began to pick up themes of that to apply in his arguments for Emancipation Proclamation and his eventual judgments of uh, what the war represented in his second inaugural address. 
So that, that kind of ties into what Sheila just put in the chat says, did his religious views start changing during the war? Or, it, I mean, I guess the question is, um, did his religious views start changing before the war? Um, and perhaps uh, how did his, his uh, views change during the war? And you've, you've talked a lot about Reverend Gurley and how much influence he had. The biggest uh, difference in his views before and during the war, uh, he has admitted that he was a uh, subscriber to the doctrine of necessity, which is a uh, form of a fatalism in which if you do believe in God, uh, which he said he did, uh, you view God as distant, as uh, a, uh, the master clockmaker who put the, the thing to, who put the machine together and then let it run according to natural laws and doesn't get involved. It's, it's a remote figure, the God that he was describing then. Uh, his God before the war primarily served the purpose of civil religion. Uh, this analogy that he drew, even in uh, the, um, the Springfield uh, speech, the uh, Lyceum address, uh, was that he recognized that God had a powerful hold on most of his 19th century countrymen there have been several revivals, and so people were regularly quoting the Bible, learning to read with the Bible. Uh, so Lincoln did participate in that, but he was more interested in applying that discipline of religious study and religious observance to the Constitution. Uh, so he was trying to wrap those together so that uh, people could think in uh, conceptual terms that they're one and the same thing. If you're going to believe in God as you do in your uh, doctrines of your religion, you also have to subscribe to how the Constitution uh, supports that, that right. So that's uh, civil religion, pure and simple, as uh, John Meacham would say. Uh, things that you are expected to say uh, just by virtue of being a public official. Uh, after he became president, or even before, uh, he started to use um, references to the type of God who was actually present in the world. That is a more traditional belief of uh, of the evangelical Christians of the 19th century, that God was everywhere present. When he left uh, Springfield, he spoke to his friends on the platform, and he said that he asked for their prayers. Uh, he recognized that he needed the help of God who could remain with you and come with me. Uh, so he starts to talk in terms of a, of a God who is more everywhere present in the world, which was a, a traditional evangelical belief. But he didn't Keep on that theme, even his inaugural address, as I pointed out, he put God in the box of being a uh, cosmic referee. You're going to pick column A or column B. That's your choice, God. Uh, that's not how God works. And he developed that sense that God's will is much more mysterious than that, that we have to figure out a way to line up with what we think his will would be based on what we know of his attributes. His love, his mercy, his justice rather than trying to force him into the box of uh, supporting whatever it is we believe. And that was, that was the point of the uh, meditation on the divine will. He was sorting that out, uh, trying to figure out what his role would be in going forward to pursue an aggressive emancipation proclamation policy, which was absolutely new in anything he's done in his political career. Could I add a little bit to that? Please. I, uh... Um, I was, the meditation on the divine will has made me wonder if Lincoln had by that time started to think that maybe God was going to, wasn't going to allow that war to end until slavery was over for good and all, which is one of the reasons he was so adamant about getting the 13th amendment passed before the end of the war, both politically, because it would have been harder after also because I think he, you know, this is my personal reading, but I think he really thought that was what was it was all about by then. Um, the other thing is I was very struck by something attributed to Lincoln that I don't know how certain it is that he did say this, but there is an account that somebody made that at one point, you know, the clergy groups would come see him all the time. And mm -hmm. Uh, once a group said to him, well, we know God is on our side. Of course, these are northern clergy. And he is said to have replied, I don't know about that. 
what I do know is that um, my whole duty and responsibility is to see that I and this nation are to be found on God's side, which is quite a different thing. Um, uh, I, I, think, I cannot find uh, that direct attribution. There's nothing that says that he definitely said that, though there are several anecdotes at different times where that type of story emerges. So it, I think it's uh, safe to say that he did express something like that, yes. Well, it sure fits with, it, I yes. think, how we, how we uh, understand Lincoln. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's very telling for why one of the th reasons he's so important um, because he just wouldn't insist that his way was the only way or the mm -hmm. only thing going on. Which, as many scholars start to describe now, uh, that made him different than most of the renowned theologians of the era, where they were so <laughs> tied up into equating God with American society and the Constitution that they couldn't see that simple fact. So... Not only did, it seems to us a simple thing to recognize, but at the time it was groundbreaking. He was a very fine theologian in every respect, in my opinion. So it's this maturing of his views through the through the war from 1862 on. Most people agree that uh, that it became most apparent in 1862, uh, but certainly crescendoed in the uh, second inaugural address. One of the best books about this was Elton Trueblood's Abraham Lincoln, Theologian of American Anguish. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a comment here in the chat, and I think it's probably John Swallow, uh, to what people, who, uh, what people who knew or had personal conversations for Lincoln were most convinced that he a believed in God and B was a Christian. Uh, the uh, the standards have changed as to how one judges a, a Christian. At the time, uh, you would say he was not because he did not fulfill the uh, the basic requirement. He did not make a public confession of his faith. Uh, the requirement for church membership and for you to say you were a Christian. So, but every aspect of his attitude, performance, language, suggests that he was certainly trying to live a life according to Christian principles, and that would be a, certainly an acceptable point today. But it's, it's no crime to consider that he knew that 80% of his voters were evangelical-type Christians, uh, either Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, um, and that they they felt a strong feel for their religion. And so it made sense for Lincoln to try to understand them better so that he could communicate more fully and in the, in the process uh, in, inculcate some of those values that made him, I think, in every respect, uh, very sincere in what he would have said uh, in any of these comments. Yeah, Sheila points out that it's interesting that by age 29, he had already had solid mm -hmm. principles. And uh, I mentioned this in my uh, talk a couple of weeks ago, where he had pretty much settled on his principles about slavery back when he was 25. So he was somebody that, you know, thought these things through pretty early. I, I'm pretty sure I wasn't thinking these kind of depth in this kind of depth back then, or maybe even still. But uh, he, he stuck by these principles. So uh, she's asking, what are some of Lincoln's principles that we need to remember and apply today? You know, how can we learn from Lincoln and as we move forward? The purpose of this country, the purpose of our relationships is to love one another and to guarantee that everyone has the same rights in the society that we enjoy. That's the fundamental value that Lincoln uh, had expressed by the time of his death. Uh, I, I wonder how we can get that across to people. <laughs> you know, I feel a little bit sometimes like we, 
like maybe Lincoln after his Lyceum address. And he says, you know, we have to stop this mobs going around and, and killing people and throwing printing presses in the, mm -hmm. in the river because we don't, we don't agree with them. And, and I mean, we look at the last couple of several years, I guess, and we just seem to be devolving in some ways. Um, you know, as, as the conversation we just had, uh, uh, Carol points out that the Lincoln never said God is on our side. Uh, it was always uh, his his purpose to make people think, how do we do better by each other? How do we get closer to what we think God intends rather than insisting this is what God wants and uh, driving that uh, into everybody else's opinions? Scott, go ahead. Um, I'll turn the I'll turn the discussion a little different direction. As we approach the uh, President's Day holiday, I have no doubt I'll start seeing on my television President Lincoln riding in a hot air balloon or driving a car down the road and selling me carpet, furniture, and everything else. So I'm curious the way that we use the Lincoln image today. I'm curious how you think that either adds or detracts from Lincoln's legacy as we might want it to be, as people interested certainly in history and Mr. Lincoln himself. Everybody wants to use Lincoln. <laughs> it, it is a tribute to the lasting impressions that he made for good. But sadly, uh, people find a way to uh, connect them with whatever cause they want. They will find something that he said that seems to suggest that uh, theirs is the right way. Uh, you have to look at the full body of evidence that uh, what his life represented, what he tried to make of his life. Uh, you go to you start with the Lyceum Address and his warning that we control passions, that uh, don't trust the people that are the loudest, that uh, have the, um, the brashest argument, uh, use calm reason to try to assess where the truth is and uh, do not fall victim. Uh, to those who are the most passionate uh, without the substance of their their beliefs. So that warning was something which he gave us, but now we find that uh, anybody, both uh, politically or commercially, uh, who can uh, suggest that, uh, uh, well, Lincoln was good, we want to identify with that for commercial reasons, but politically uh, taking lines out of context and trying to uh, suggests that he would have supported such and such a position. Uh, in the total context of his work, you have to realize that he was much more humble in how he pronounced judgment on what we should be doing and stuck to a few basic principles, which had to do with promoting everybody, establishing justice for all, and wanting to uh, bring the force of government to supporting the expansion of rights wherever we could. I'm interested, John, it reminds me of something Robert Lincoln said. He, he said that people always asked him what his father would have thought about fill in the blank. And Robert Lincoln wrote a letter, I believe it was to Columbia Magazine, a letter to the editor. And, and I love this quote. He said, my father's name has become a peg on which to hang many things. And I think that underlines just what you said about just that everyone wants to attach Mr. Lincoln to their father or whatever. <laughs> Uh, that that raises another uh, paradox, I guess. You have uh, today, for example, um, Justice Breyer uh, in his speech to mm -hmm. at the White House saying that he was retiring from the Supreme Court. He invoked Abraham Lincoln uh, last week when the different two different parties and the current parties were talking about the voting rights uh, uh, bills and, and whether they should even discuss voting rights bills and vote on it. Um, you know, both parties kept mentioning Lincoln. And as we've seen over and over and over again, it's almost obligatory for a politician mm -hmm. to quote Lincoln um, in anything they say, whether Lincoln actually said what they're quoting or, or not. And so clearly, politicians believe that the public um, reveres Lincoln, and that by invoking Lincoln, they can be on get on the get on the right side of Lincoln. 
But on the other hand, you pointed out in your talk, there are Native Americans who, in particular with the, the, the Dakota situation in, in Minnesota, who don't think so highly of Lincoln. And there are African Americans who also don't, leave, don't feel so highly of Lincoln. And I suppose you could, you could question people carrying uh, Confederate battle flags into the, into the Capitol, whether, you know, what they think about Lincoln. Um, I'm wondering, you know, how do you, do you have any sense of, of how to sort out that, that just paradox, that strange? Well, just based on our earlier uh, discussion, uh, who wants to attach to Lincoln? It's, uh, it seems that he is most popular with those who feel connected with American society, with American law, with American civilization as broadly understood. Uh, and the progress that that implies. Uh, those who are most disaffected are those who are either still suffering from the loss of the Civil War or uh, who don't appreciate what Lincoln did uh, to enhance everybody uh, during his life and, uh, and presidency. Uh, as I pointed out in the discussion of the hanging of the 38 Dakota Sioux, uh, there was not one voice in the country raised to support their position. Uh, in fact, uh, the vast majority of white Americans just thought that uh, in, any Indian tribe that was uh, involved in any attack on any white Americans, they should all die. You know, we hear the phrase, uh, no, no good Indian but a dead Indian. That, uh, that was pretty much the psychology of, uh, of 19th century America. Uh, so Lincoln bucked that. Uh, to take on the case of these 300 Sioux warriors and try to push back on his own government and society to recognize that these people had rights as well and they need to be respected, at least in this case, in a court of law. Uh, but uh, there, were, there were originally 1,700 warriors arrested and the hue and cry was to kill them all. So, uh, and then we see that Lincoln indeed lo did lose support in Minnesota during the following election. So there was, he understood the situation he was in and recognized that he wasn't going to get anybody on site uh, to help press the point, but he took it upon himself during December 1862, when he had a major cabinet crisis, when he had the major union loss at Fredericksburg, that uh, 16,000 men died in front of a uh, enforced uh, hill site. And he was getting ready to release the Emancipation Proclamation. He still took time from that kind of a schedule to focus on 303 trial cases for Sioux warriors and to find that only 38 of them seemed to have enough evidence to substantiate that. There was no support in the country for that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Go ahead, Scott. John, sorry, I'm trying to figure out which way you can see my hand better. As I, I can see both ways. <laughs> um, I was, I was, I always appreciate when you had mentioned the Greeley letter and how people focus in on that kind of that one part of the body and mm -hmm. use that to kind of support. The, see, he didn't care about the slaves. All he cared about was this. And I, and, I, and if I, I if I missed it and you said this, I apologize. But I'm always struck by the people that don't read the rest of the letter mm -hmm. and the very last line of his letter. Mm -hmm. I have here stated my purpose according to my view of my duty. duty, and I intend no modification to my off-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. Lincoln was stating his professional duty and what he felt like his role of the president allowed him to do from a practical standpoint. So I appreciate that you mentioned that, that, that people that attach out of that just aren't even simply reading the rest of the same letter, for goodness sake. <laughs> Absolutely. Good point. Uh, Carolyn Branduzin, go ahead. You're on mute. Can you hear there, me? There yeah. Carolyn. Yeah. Thank you very much, Scott. I agree. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, 
we can point out that uh, Caroline has a, uh, a special interest in that. Uh, it was her ancestor that helped Lincoln craft uh, that uh, to Greeley. So, uh, Caroline, thank you very much for bringing that up. And uh, yeah. James C. Wellen. <laughs> Correct. You want me to talk a little bit about that? But that's, yeah, it is a beautiful document. And thank you, John, you know, for talking about it tonight. The way you just packaged it so beautifully was really perfect. Thank you, John. Her family has the original, <laughs> has access to uh, it. <laughs> Uh, Carol, you put something in the in the chat. You want to just uh, ask that, and I guess it's a kind of an open ended question. <laughs> well, I I it just um, I was thinking about when you were talking about the people who admire Lincoln and how broad that is. Is it's really struck me over the years learning just what a wide political spectrum of people admire Lincoln. Uh, you know, I mean, Obama admires Lincoln very much and did long before he was president. Um, mm -hmm. Understand his Senate office was full of Lincoln stuff. And on the other hand, Rhode Island Chief Justice Frank Williams, who many of us know from the Lincoln Forum, is very politically conservative. I was kind of shocked to hear some of the things he had to say one time when I heard him speak. And he admires Lincoln very much. So, I mean, how is that possible? I, I haven't figured that one out. If you have some enlightenment for me on that one, I'd like to hear it. Easy to cherry pick them. <laughs> is that it? Cherry picking? Well, that's what a lot of historians do. Lincoln is more than just a politician, too. Hopefully they find some value just in his personal characteristics as well. Well, I guess that's a good thought. Um, I'll have to think about that. I wonder if, and maybe John can answer this, I wonder if today everybody everybody invokes Lincoln. It doesn't matter what Lincoln stood for or what you stand for. It's you, All you want to do is mention Lincoln's name because you think the people will you know, be, a, be on your side, whether it's the same side that Lincoln ever was or not. On, on, and of course, certain issues didn't exist when Lincoln was there. But I wonder if there's a certain amount of that and today's today people do it as well, but also back in what you're talking about, John, back in Lincoln's time where you were in, and people were invoking God all the time, um, even for things that weren't necessarily, you know, godlike or, you know, you, you have people who they, they understand what people, what influences the public and who the public looks up to mm -hmm. and and then basically use it as a manipulative tool um do you think that that's that's the case these days for and, and it it doesn't matter which side you know from obama or from uh you know frank white or some other conservative side do you think that they they're kind of just invoking Lincoln and more as a tool to get more credence, credibility David, for their position. David, or? I deliberately picked Obama and Frank Williams because I know both of them have paid a lot of attention to what and know a lot about Lincoln. It's not about politics for either of them. It's something they really are interested in. And, and yet you're suggesting they come to very different conclusions. Well, I haven't actually read stuff they've written about Lincoln, so I can't say whether they're cherry picking or not, but it is a it is interesting to me that people with such very opposed political views both can admire the same person. Oh, I see. Okay. For what reason? I don't know. <laughs> well, John, do you have any thoughts on uh, I, how they can do that? I hear odd, odd arguments being made as to why uh, Lincoln uh, would have supported their position. Uh, certainly, we've, you know, it was mentioned President's Day is coming up and Lincoln's going to sell a lot of cars and furniture. But we know that the Republican view is that Lincoln is, is popular. He was the founder of the party. Uh, and they can point to certain um, conservative principles that he espoused. But 
After all, Lincoln was the, the founder of the big government of the modern era. Uh, he was the uh, founder of a government that supported the uh, people in need. Uh, and he was the founder of the effort to secure expansive human rights for minority groups. And I don't know that that's the top of the agenda for the, the modern Republican Party. So I, I wonder, there are traditional values that Lincoln represents, yes, conservative and what we would today call progressive. But the, when you look at the headline items, I don't see that translation being well made to the current uh, leadership of the Republican Party. That doesn't stop people from trying to attach uh, the good feeling that Americans seem to generally still have with Lincoln uh, to their cause. Sheila, do you want to uh, come on and talk about what you put in the chat just now? We'll give it a try. I have my dog next to me who's jealous of this. So, um, hey, Sheila. <laughs> hi, John. Uh, and thank you for the nice tour of New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. I treasure that. Um, as I view, as I observe and learn and continue to read and learn about Lincoln, it seems to me the times then, the issues then, the culture then was really different than it is now. And it's really easy, I think, for people on today's left to see issues that they relate to Lincoln and want to claim them as their own. And it's really easy for people on today's right to do the same thing. I, I think, and, and I think they're both correct. Uh, no one is claiming something that isn't true. They're not saying, they're not giving Lincoln political attributes that aren't true. It's just some of his stuff would be akin to today's left. Some would be akin to today's right. Um, it, that's just kind of obvious. And it is interesting. And I think it's, it is interesting that people across the political spectrum are interested in Lincoln, like she said. And, and I think it's wonderful that she took note of that and and mentioned it and can give us all reason to uh, give us a moment to think about that and i think that helps build bridges if we pause and think about the fact that people on the other side of our own political spectrum also have reason to legitimate reason to admire abraham lincoln mm -hmm that can build bridges and, and give us common ground. Isn't that interesting? He can be, uh, you know, someone to give us common ground. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's good to open our minds to, hey, you know, people across today's political spectrum can legitimately see things in Lincoln that, they can agree with. That's what I would say. There's no question that he appeals to a broad spectrum of, of political view, that he had conservative elements, he had liberal elements. Uh, I think the how much license we'll give uh, to allow people to continue to adopt him really depends on some definition of a set of core values. Uh, Lincoln revered the Constitution and the structure of government and its traditions. And yet on the, the political right, uh, challenging elections is not something that Lincoln would have done, uh, is not something he would have condoned. Uh, he would want to do whatever he could after an election to close ranks again, to realize the legitimacy of the elected government. Uh, this, uh, there's no way he would have been involved in anything which diminishes respect for the, uh, the voice of the people electing the, the right government. So it's, it's that type of fundamental value that I think troubles people on not appreciating what Lincoln really represented. Uh, respect for the Constitution, respect for the traditions, respect for the trans, the peaceful transition of power, uh, even under the most difficult circumstances. And then secondly, to uh, enhance everywhere he could 
uh, incorporation of uh, minorities into the broad spectrum of American life. Uh, that uh, those are two huge things, which uh, it's tough to argue uh, would not have been fundamental to Lincoln's core then or now. Yeah, I think it, you captured that pretty well, John, that the core values. And I'm wondering if Lincoln, who was certainly partisan, I mean, it was a partisan. League, Absolutely. <laughs> but he, but maybe he wasn't so much ideological. And I'm not sure if I could actually verbalize the difference between those two things. Um, does that, is that something that make, would make any sense to you, John? Well, if, <laughs> He he was uh, he was a partisan. Uh, he spent much of his time in office uh, finding the right people to put in office who would support him and support Republican values. So I I'm not I'm not so sure that we can rule out ideology because it was different then. Uh, so just because the concept may be defined differently then as now, I, I'm reluctant to say that he was not as ideological as a politician would be today. Uh, but still, it did not get in the way of his uh, continually asserting his support for these core values, which uh, never got away from him in his administration. Go ahead, Scott. Just to kind of tack that on, I, I know, I always think of Lincoln as someone who had an ideology, but he was more of a practical politician than he was in <laughs> ideologist, if that makes sense. <laughs> that's um, that's a key Sinha distinction. Yes, yeah, so I'll buy that. Uh, Manisha Sinha, in a, in a talk about Lincoln and the abolitionists, talked about that, how Garrison wanted his supporters as abolitionists to support Lincoln. He said, I don't want us to become politicians because then we have to compromise. Mm -hmm. We need to be pure ideology to push the needle. Someone like Lincoln, who's a practical politician, can move us closer to our ultimate target. So he had an ideology, but he was also a practical politician. Yes. Uh, I'm really not sure that uh, his circumstance would translate well into the modern era. Remember that uh, most, most of his political opposition left the field. <laughs> and so he only had to... Uh, thread the needle with a more narrow band of opposition than if the Southerners had stayed in the Congress. Uh, so I'm not sure that we can translate that well today to what, say, Joe Biden has to do to try to negotiate the same types of compromises. He's got the full spectrum and the full weight of uh, an aggressive minority uh, party uh, working uh, against him. Lincoln didn't have that, so he could afford to do other things in a high-minded fashion that maybe not possible today. Well, I mean, Lincoln, Lincoln, I guess you could look at it too as uh, what the situation was as far as the position. As, as president, you're president for the whole country, mm -hmm. or at least you're supposed to be president for the whole country. And most presidents I try to be president for the, for the country, well, to some extent, at least, maybe not so much early on. But, you know, the, you, you have a different responsibility than you do if you're, say, a congressman or a state legislature or even a senator, um, where you're, you have a, a very, a much more limited constituency that you're supposed to be representing. So I think as, as you get, as you get into being president, you, you have at least the obligation, whether you follow through on it, to think what's best for the country. And, and I do think Lincoln, um, I do think Lincoln was uh, somebody who, he was ambitious, but he was ambitious to do things that he thought was best for the country, even though he might butt heads with his own, his own party. And, and I think that's something maybe we need to learn from today. Because Lincoln had the radical Republicans, you know, essentially the, the, the Bernie Sanders wing of, mm -hmm. of, of that of the Republican Party at the time who were able they were abolitionists and they were they, they really wanted the massive change that just wasn't you know possible in 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 reality at that time and Lincoln found a way to, to, to work with them 
work with the, the, the Democratic Party, the more conservative members of Congress to try to figure out how to you know, find some common ground and move forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that that's true? And, and is that a lesson that we could learn and today's politicians could learn? Well, it is, but it, does it apply today? I mean, say the, the other side wasn't there, so he didn't have to deal with them. Uh, that's why he adopted his uh, border state strategy. Uh, he was elevating the conservatives uh, in the border states uh, and using that foil to stave off the, the radicals, uh, all the while trying to come to some consensus as to what they could agree on, trying to bring them together, which essentially never happened. He finally had to build his a bigger base of support among the abolitionist leanings of the northern population. So it never really worked in the way that we might have to design it today. Uh, yeah, I suppose that's true. Surprise. Half the country and, and one basic you know, ideology decides to that they're no longer part of the country. I guess they don't get a say anymore. <laughs> but he wanted them back. Eh? People express surprise that I don't use uh, in talking about his legacy, his most famous speeches, the uh, address in the second inaugural of I think those are more self-evident than some of the things which I tried to bring to play today I tried to show that there was a theme in, in Lincoln's thinking that developed at an early age and continued uh, throughout with the with the evolution of his belief in God uh, during the Civil War as, as driving the last change in his uh, in what we consider to be his legacy today but consider an inaugural address. Uh, how would that go over today? Where it wasn't a rah-rah speech bringing people together, but it was pronouncing collective judgment. You all are responsible. We are all responsible. And trying to get people to realize that that's a collective responsibility as well to now deal with the healing, both North and South coming together. He didn't just say, we're gonna take care of the widows and orphans of the Northern soldiers. He said all who fought in the war. So I think that type of universal approach uh, is, would not be as well accepted today as he got away with in 1865. But that represents the true spirit of Lincoln, this, uh, this all embracing forgiveness, no malice, Let's get it together, work it out, and move forward. Uh, which, which, you know, obviously he didn't get a chance to really implement. But I, I wonder if that that isn't the crux of the problem, and that it, and that back then, what happened then is very similar to today. I mean, then you had the the, the slaveholding states pull themselves out of the union and then have to be reassimilated. Um, but there quickly was were attempts to try to um, disenfranchise the new rights that African Americans had gotten, um, and then of course there's uh, Native Americans where everybody pretty much you know considered them not to have any rights right from the beginning, long before we were a country. So I you know I, I just sometimes I wonder how different we really are. Um, I have a couple of points that I, I just want to raise because John Chamberlain has a couple of things in the in the chat. He said there was a conservative author that spoke at Ford's a few years ago, I, I assume at the uh, at the ALI symposium, um, who lauded Lincoln as a proponent of capitalism. Um, apparently, he did not get a favorable reception. I can't think of who that is. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else knows or if you were there. Um, just throw that in the chat because I'm, I'm curious as to who that was. Um, but uh, he later he says that ironically, both current Congress uh, representatives and senators, both sides of the party of the aisle, often justify their stances opposing the president, whoever the president is at the time, on the basis of that opposition being good for the country. And I guess that raises the question of of personal political integrity, 
and honesty uh, versus uh, just straight partisanship. We're going to oppose everything that the president says, whether because we don't care, because it's not good for our party. If mm -hmm. so, we're not going to let him gain anything. That that to some extent still happened, at least with uh, maybe the Copperhead uh, side of things in Lincoln's time. Obviously, all of the big opposition had left, and that's why. Homestead Act passed. That's why rail, uh, the Pacific Railroad Act passed. All these other acts passed only because one side had taken themselves out of the voting pool. Mm -hmm. Well, the, there were still legitimate uh, political concerns and opposition on a whole range of economic issues. Uh, the fact of the national debt, uh, the currency, uh, creating a currency which wasn't gold-backed. Uh, the income tax. Uh, there were a number of very controversial measures that uh, there was robust political pushback on. Uh, and if the Congress had included the Southern representatives, certainly would not have been approved. Uh, so that aspect of uh, managing the politics, even though there was confrontation, it was still a lot easier now that the majority of the uh, conservative opposition had uh, had left the field. Mm. Plenty of uh, debate on substantive issues uh, that Lincoln had to contend with. And, uh, was he a capitalist? He certainly believed in the, the bootstrap theory that you know, everybody has an opportunity to lift themselves up. And he would point to his own example as, uh, as the best uh, way to look at it. But he would laud the... Uh, uh, the working man is having an opportunity to make a wage, to save some money, uh, to invest in a business, and then to go on to hire people in his business. So that was the the American growth model that uh, that he espoused. Uh, that was certainly a capitalist oriented uh, uh, theology. Uh, but he also appreciated Karl Marx. That uh, <laughs> that. Uh, uh, well, I don't know how much he how much he real he appreciated Karl Marx, but well, how the greatest much he understood the, the greatest, Karl Marx, but the greatest, he certainly for pushed the greatest that, number was what he took away. Huh? Yeah, true, mm -hmm. and and certainly the Homestead Act and the and the Morrill Land Grant Act those would mm -hmm. be con called socialist today because they gave federal money to uh, mm -hmm. to individuals and to the states to um, to educate and to move west and. So, you know, clearly those are, you know, by today's definitions, those are, those are socialist um, types of, of, of activities. Um, and there were a lot of people who did, disagreed with that. I, I think what, I, uh, before we, we look for last questions, um, I wanted to say something about um, what Sheila was saying earlier that you know you have people on on both sides of the political spectrum um, and everywhere in between who who firmly who have a legitimate connection with Lincoln who can you know, maybe it's cherry picking but they can pick you know parts of Lincoln at least that we like and I guess we all seem to do that um, but I'm wondering uh, and John your thoughts on whether how much you think people really understand enough about Lincoln to really understand what it is that they're they're claiming Lincoln would be on their side for? Um, uh, Barack Obama, had, like was mentioned, has a had a particular affinity for Lincoln, but he's not a Lincoln scholar. He he hasn't studied Lincoln. He hasn't he, he's read Team of Rivals, but I don't, I don't know what else he's read. Um, but you know, he certainly is not somebody who has spent his entire career studying Lincoln, and and then you get pretty much everybody else in Congress and politics they don't study Lincoln. They 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 get picked little pieces, and that I think is and what a lot of people do. And I'm wondering, like, how do we how do we deal with the fact that most people have some understanding of Lincoln? But most of that understanding is is very small relative to what there is to know. And some of it isn't even right. I mean, it's just totally wrong, in fact. How do we deal with that? I mean, how do we how do we, since we're a Lincoln group, how do we um, how do we reach everybody so that they have a better understanding at least of Lincoln? 
uh, I appreciate this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, we are all required to learn a lot of facts every day, a lot of information that we have to process. So very few people can afford to spend the time on one topic as we do. So I would just hope to take advantage of uh, people uh, such as you uh, who participate in these forums and discussion uh, that you take away a sense of the uh, robust idealism of uh, someone like a Lincoln, uh, take away some of the events that seem to drive our understanding of what he stood for and carry the word on. It's, uh, there, there are good, solid reasons to appreciate what this person in his time did for this country uh, and set the example that we continue to love to draw on for whatever reason. So I'm just as happy to think that that legacy of respect for a career and a life continues. And that as long as his name is used in a positive way, I think we have accomplished our purpose. But for those of us who enjoy a deeper dive into what that means, uh, there's certainly plenty of room still to explore. Issues that get to be developed in what uh, Lincoln uh, really stood for. David, I think the event um, at the Lincoln Memorial in May is gonna hopefully help us do that. I hope so, so yes. We're doing and, what we can. And we wanna make these, these, uh, these videos available uh, to people. And, you know, we're, we're, we're doing, we're doing what we can, um, you know, we can only reach so many people and, uh, but us each individually can at least bore all our friends with all this Lincoln information. And, uh, but, it, you know, John's right, you know, we- I am deeply we, grateful we, for the support of this group for the activities of the Lincoln Group of the District of Columbia. Thank you very much for being part of this and for helping us develop our common interest. Does anybody have any last question they, they desperately want to, to ask? And um, I think we'll, if not, we will uh, thank John and, and move on. And if anybody remembers who that person was, uh, <laughs> Scott, Sorry. go ahead and ask your question. Just one just popped into my head with the <laughs> idea of Lincoln's legacy. And since we have John, who did a wonderful talk tonight, and Ed Steers here as well, I'm curious about the role that Lincoln's assassination played in his ongoing legacy, how we remember him, and how that may have changed the way we remember him moving forward. Ed, that's in your sweet spot. Go ahead. Bingo. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's where Lincoln was elevated to, uh, to a religious figure in the country. The, the assassination had a great deal to do with that. It, just as it did with John Kennedy, you know, who had a very, very poor uh, uh, poll rating immediately before his assassination. One of the reasons he went down to Texas, but he immediately was elevated amongst the top 10 presidents in the United States following his assassination. So it had a big effect, certainly at the time and for the rest of the 19th century. Um, it elevated them tremendously. Uh, well, I wouldn't worry or put too much effort into trying to figure out why politicians uh, seem to uh, adopt Lincoln, uh, because I think it's purely pragmatic politics uh, with a lot of hypocrisy. And as far as the general public is concerned, I, 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 we're back to that old, it, it's just two things. He saved the union and freed the slaves. If you were to give, ask that question to elementary school kids or junior high school or high school kids, that's the answer they all would give you. Saved the union and freed the slaves. And beyond that, they really don't know anything else. And it's probably an indicator that uh, if you talk about Google searches or research searches that uh, you hear the statistic all the time that about half of the interest in Lincoln is regarding the assassination. So that's still a uh, tremendous popular source of the interest. Yeah.
tremendously I, popular. You get a, make a lot of hay out of it. It also makes me think. I have. <laughs> it also makes me think just about the fact that he was assassinated. That people then actively, almost immediately, sought out accounts about Lincoln and his life that we might not have had. And you can weigh the value of those and how accurate some of those are. But certainly, Herndon immediately went out and sought out people from Lincoln's early life. If Lincoln hadn't been assassinated, I'm not so sure we would have all these other accounts of Lincoln otherwise, other than his political papers. Heard that? Hmm. Absolutely right. I think you're hmm. absolutely right, Scott. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, look, without Herndon, what will we have? <laughs> well, Herndon, I think, tried to, you know, he his goal was to present the real Lincoln with all his warts. And, and then Nicolay and Hayes' goal was to present a more um, idolized. Robert Lincoln. Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln. Right, <laughs> right. And that was the norm prior to, to Lincoln for biographies, they were supposed to be idolatry. They, they were, you know, this person was the greatest thing since life's thread. That's why you have, you know, all these fables in, in the book about uh, George Washington and the cherry tree and, and half the other things in there that aren't true. You know, they wanted to, you know, to glorify, to glorify people. So yeah, I, I'm very appreciative that Herndon did all the work he did. Um, we also have, we're lucky that we hit a period of time with Lincoln where there were much more in the way of paper records being kept and held on to um, than back in, in Washington's time and, and certainly before that. Any other last uh, comments uh, does anybody have or questions? Okay, John, unless you have something you'd like to add, uh, I think we would, we'll, we'll call it a night. Appreciate very this nice attention and discussion. Thank Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, okay. everyone. Thank you, everyone, for, for participating, and we'll have all of these videos up online shortly. Night. Good night. Mm -hmm.